Hi, I'm Jenny Shampoo. I'm the director of the Book of Mormon Art Catalog, and we're joined today by John Hilton III. Hey, Hi. thanks for letting me come, Jenny. <laughs> thanks for being here. You bet. Um, John is a professor of religious education at BYU, and he's the author of several, several books, including Considering the Cross and Voices in the Book of Mormon. And he also has a fantastic podcast called The Book of Mormon, A Masterclass. So thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. I'm excited to be here. We're looking at 3rd Nephi, verses 1 through 7. And the piece we're looking at is by the artist Jorge Coco, and it's called His Marks. Um, so, John, can you first tell us in these early chapters of 3rd Nephi, what is going on that sets us up for this scene? So 3rd Nephi chapter 1 through 7, we might say, is kind of the best of times and the worst of times yeah. amongst the Nephites. You've got this free interchange between the Nephites and the Lamites. There's a lot of prosperity at times, but we've never seen more pride. We've never seen mm -hmm. a, more of a rise of secret combinations. Mm -hmm. So like a high early on is the coming, the sign of Christ's birth. Okay. And so mm -hmm. then you've got this time where there's a lot of people who are believing, but then doubt starts mm -hmm. to creep in. There's some uh, periods of warfare mm -hmm. uh, amongst the Nephite Lamanites who have combined against the secret combinations. Right. Uh, and then a time period of peace and prosperity once the secret combinations have been wiped out. But it, it's kind of like you just see the pride cycle spinning around and mm -hmm. around. And by the time we get to the end of our chapters for this week, 3rd Nephi chapter 7, mm -hmm. the Nephite government has collapsed and there's mm -hmm. only a few people who seem to be really believing mm -hmm. in Jesus Christ. The prophet Nephi is, this is Nephi the son of, oh boy, now we're, now we're <laughs> testing ourselves on our Nephi's and Helaman's. I believe this is Nephi, the son of Nephi, right. the son of Helaman, the son of Helaman, the son of Alma, the son of Alma. I think that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I got that in my notes. Yeah. Okay, that was, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you're, you got that down. Um, so this Nephi, who's the same Nephi that was back in 3rd Nephi chapter 1, mm -hmm. praying about the sign of Christ, he's still the prophet in 3rd Nephi right. 7, preaching to the mm -hmm. people before the um, mm -hmm. destruction that mm -hmm. takes place after Christ's death. Okay, so we start with the signs of Christ's birth, and mm -hmm. then the scripture block ends with the signs of Christ's death. Yeah, so our, we're actually kind of uh, skipping ahead just mm -hmm. a little bit. I hope that's mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. I hope yeah. that doesn't make anyone mad. But um, <laughs> yeah, so where we end in 3rd Nephi chapter 7, it's mm -hmm. uh, just before mm -hmm. the signs of Christ's death, which will right. appear in 3rd Nephi chapter 8. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, and you know, it's interesting, there actually isn't a lot of art um, based on those first seven chapters of 3rd Nephi. So artists, if you're out there listening, mm. that's a good place where we need more art. It really is true. Like yeah. the, the stories of Gideonhi, for mm -hmm. example, and Laconius. Yeah. I mean, I know exactly what Abinadi looks like. I have no idea what <laughs> Laconius looks like because right. I just haven't seen yeah. artwork about him. Yeah, yeah. So we picked this piece, which comes from 3rd Nephi 11. Um, do you want to ground us a little bit in the yeah. scriptures here? What's, what's okay, happening? so as we know, um, there's been the destruction mm -hmm. amongst the Nephites, and then that's at the beginning of the 34th year of the reign of the judges. And it's not until the end of the 30 and 4th year of the reign of the judges. So there's a period of months that have mm -hmm. elapsed. Some mm -hmm. people have gathered together at the temple in Bountiful, and while they're there, they hear a voice, and they see a man descending out from heaven. Okay. And I want to just highlight in these verses, mm -hmm. the very first thing that Jesus Christ does is he says, I'm Jesus Christ, who the prophets testified should come into the world. Mm -hmm. And then he gives this invitation. He says, arise and come forth unto me that you may thrust your hands into my side and also that you may feel the prints of the nails in my hands and in my feet, that you may know that I am the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth and have been slain for the sins of the world. So we'll, like, we'll talk more about this in a second, but it's, to me it's very interesting that in the very beginning mm -hmm. of his introduction to the people, he talks about his death, that mm. he was slain for the sins of the world, and then he invites the people to come and feel his crucifixion wounds. Hmm. In the of Fast, the multitude went forth and thrust their hands into his side and did feel the prints of the nails in his hands and in his feet. And this they did do, going forth one by one, until they had all gone forth, and did see with their eyes, and did feel with their hands, and did know of a surety, and did bear record that it was he of whom it was written by the prophets that should come. So that's one of the things that I love about this image here, is that we're seeing the individuals 
coming and having this experience with Jesus Christ, looking at and touching the marks in mm -hmm. his hands and mm -hmm. his feet. Yeah, so I know you've written a lot about crucifixion imagery and studied how that's been used in Latter-day Saint art and um, iconography. So why, why is that important and, and how, how does this compare to other depictions of the crucifixion? So one of the things that you know super well is that <laughs> art really shapes what we think about yeah. scripture. Right. So in this case, actually, within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we tend not to focus on crucifixion artwork. Right. In general, if you walk into a chapel, you're not going to see images of the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. And our colleague, uh, Anthony Sweat, and yeah. I, we did a little bit of research where we actually asked people about images that they liked. Mm. And Latter-day Saints, relative to other Christians, tended to like crucifixion images less. Oh, interesting. And I think it is interesting because we, um, that in starts to influence what we believe. Many Latter-day Saints don't put as much emphasis on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ as the scriptures do. Mm -hmm. Now, Jenny, please don't misunderstand me. I'm, I'm not saying that Gethsemane isn't important. Right. But notice Jesus Christ didn't say, I am he who has suffered for your sins in Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. He says, I was slain for the sins of the world. Jesus mm -hmm. himself mm -hmm. is emphasizing, come see my crucifixion wounds. Mm -hmm. And so I think this, ki like this uh, kind of artwork, and we'll talk more about this specific piece in a moment, I think is really helpful yeah. because if I'm, which this actually literally was me as a 30 year old living in Miami, Florida, we bought the gospel art kit and we were kind of showing it to our kids. And when we got to the image of the crucifixion, my son was really interested and he's like, mm. what's, what's this dad? And I'm like, ah, we're just going to skip past that. We don't, we don't look at that. Yeah. Um, what a missed opportunity right. to teach my son about mm -hmm. the event that Jesus Christ himself defined as his greatest act of love. Jesus says, greater love has no one than this to lay down their life for their friends. And mm -hmm. that's what Jesus is doing. Hmm. So I think we can't underestimate the importance of art mm -hmm. in religious understanding. Mm -hmm. And then uh, by extension, we can't underestimate the importance of crucifixion art to help us understand this central act yeah. as part of Christ's atonement. Oh, I love that. And I notice in this piece, even his pose, the way he kind of has his arms out, it's, I mean, it's not a full-on sort of crucifixion image, but hmm. but the way he's centered in the picture and then has this sort of forward pose with his arms out reminds me of hmm. just like hearkening back to that moment on the cross and, and then showing the wounds from that moment. So if you don't mind, maybe I can just ask yeah. you, what is, what's your opinion in general on crucifixion artwork? Like, hmm. is this a painting that you would want to have in your living room or would that make you feel hmm. uncomfortable? Um, no, this would not make me uncomfortable, no. Um, but it's true that we don't use it as much in our own Latter-day Saint culture. Um, that we tend to focus more on the garden of Gethsemane yeah. scenes. Um, but I think there's something really powerful about this moment and the, the awe that you see in the faces of these people as, I mean, even this figure here in the front that's kind of pointing like, mm. wow, like, did, did you guys see this? <laughs> like, look, like, they're just, they're overcome. Um, and uh, I think it's really powerful. A lot of the figures are, are pointing, drawing our eye to mm. these, these marks. Um, I, I like the way Christ is symbolically dressed in white here, um, showing you know, his, his triumph and, and resurrection and um, holiness. I love the, the beams of light coming down from heaven. Um, and I even love, at first this kind of threw me off, but, because it felt a little unbalanced to me that there's these, these crowded space of figures here and then this kind of open, empty space mm. um, and this diagonal cutting across. Yeah, that's true. I hadn't noticed that. But the more I looked at it, the more I liked it. Um, and it, it, I felt it just opened up some space for um, kind of a stillness, just kind of a, mm. an emptiness or a stillness or just space to sit and ponder, kind of like these mm. people are... Um, and it, it, it feels it feels like a very quiet scene to me, even in spite of all the figures in it. I think that open space just lends a sense of sort of sacred stillness to it that um, feels very contemplative. Mm, I love those insights. Yeah. 
One of the things I think is interesting is in a week or two from now, we'll be in 35 chapter 18, mm -hmm. where Christ introduces the sacrament to the group at the uh, temple. Mm -hmm. And he'll say, uh, as you do this, remember the body which I have shown unto you. Mm -hmm. Now, I think there's two ways that we can think about that. Sometimes you'll hear people say, Jesus, this is telling us to remember the resurrected Christ because Jesus comes as a resurrected Savior. So when he says, remember the body I've shown you, we should remember the resurrected Christ. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of good in that approach. Mm -hmm. The other uh, way of looking at it, which I think sometimes we miss, is that when Jesus shows them his body, what mm -hmm. he's emphasizing is the crucifixion. Mm -hmm. So we can also see when he says, do this in remembrance of the body which I have shown you, it's a reminder to us to think on the death of Jesus Christ as yeah. we partake of the sacrament. Yeah. I was once talking with a, a group of about 100 Latter-day Saints, and I just asked, how many of you think about Christ's death mm -hmm. specifically mm -hmm. during the sacrament? And it was not as many as you would suspect. Mm -hmm. A lot of people were thinking about the atonement in general or thinking about mm -hmm. Christ in Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and again, I'm not saying that we shouldn't think about Gethsemane, and I definitely love the idea of thinking of the resurrected Christ during yeah. the sacrament. I think this is not an either or, it's right. a both and. Yeah, I, I'm interested that you said the atonement in general, um, because I do think we tend to do that. We talk about just the concept of atonement, but I, I think the atonement is you can't separate it from Christ. Like Christ is the atonement. And you can't talk about the atonement without Christ. Like there is no atonement without Christ. And sometimes I think we make the mistake of thinking about atonement as a process or a concept, but it's it's our savior. The atonement is the savior. And um, I don't know, sometimes I wish we would focus more on just the savior, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. And it, there's an interesting uh, latter day connection mm -hmm. in Doctrine and Covenants section six, verse 36 is a famous verse. Probably everyone who's watching has it memorized. It's look unto me in mm -hmm. every thought, mm -hmm. doubt not, fear not. Yeah. So you go up to someone and you can, have, if you want to have a little fun, you can say, hey, do you know this verse? They'll be like, oh yeah, I love that verse. <laughs> and you say, what's the very next verse say? Oh. No one knows. Yeah. Verse 37, you have Jesus saying, behold, which means fix your eyes upon the wounds in my hands and in my feet and in my mm -hmm. side. In other words, the living Christ in Doctrine and Covenants section six is urging us to fix our eyes on his crucifixion wounds. Mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting that everyone needs to go and, and buy this painting. Um, if anyone wants to buy this painting <laughs> and send it to me, I'd love to have it in my <laughs> living room. Um, but I think it's just a great reminder mm -hmm. that we don't need to be squeamish mm -hmm. about Christ's crucifixion wounds. Again, the living Christ has invited us to look yeah. at them, to fix our mm -hmm. eyes on them. And I think there's a lot of mm -hmm. spiritual power that can come mm -hmm. as we reflect on Christ's resurrection, as we reflect on him in the Garden of Gethsemane, yeah. and also right. his crucifixion, which yeah. seems to, that he himself seems to be emphasizing here in 3511. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Anything else you want to add? Or well, I, there's no, just one last here? thing that I want to yeah. ask, and, and maybe you uh, have, have already covered this, but Jorge Coco does a very interesting mm -hmm. kind of art. And right. what, what can you tell me about <laughs> the is it yeah. sacro cubalism, I that, believe is the yeah. right terminology? Right. So Jorge Coco um, is originally from Argentina. Um, he lives in Texas now. And yeah, he developed what he calls sacro cubism, which is a sort of modified cubist style. When you see those sort of fractured lines, fractured space, and people are a little bit abstracted. Um, and, you know, to, to me, I, I think that's nice. It, I think it opens up a little bit of space for um, spaces to not be as clearly defined, and then the viewer can maybe bring their own interpretation a little more to the piece. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I, I really like what he's doing with space here. Mm -hmm. and, and these sort of two have this kind of bisected um, plane of space. Um, and, uh, and I think that, that lends a really interesting effect. Um, you know, some, some of his work is done in a more traditional figurative style, uh, some of his earlier pieces. Um, but yeah, but he's developed this and I think, I think um, done something really interesting with this new style. Yeah, it's powerful. Yeah. 
Well, Jenny, I just like to wrap up by just sharing my witness that I know that these events that we've read about and that we're seeing and talking about really happened. Like Jesus Christ really yeah. lives. Yeah. And this moment where he invites the people one by one to have an experience with him is one that I believe each one of us will eventually have in the future. And in the meantime, I know that we can have this one by one connection with Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs>